Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series. This is the second lesson in this new series entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. And this particular lesson is entitled, The Message of Hebrews. It's the lesson number two for January 8th of 2022. And we'd like to begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our kind Father, as we now try to put together as far as possible the picture of Paul writing to this group of people that we don't know very much about back not too long before he is going to be executed. And he's trying to encourage them to stand firm and remain faithful. So help us to see what we can learn from his, these lessons is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the next question, we, our first lesson was about who was the book written to? Now the big question is, why was the book of Hebrews written? Jim, can you help us? A Jewish document written a few decades after Hebrews, around A.D. 100, contains a prayer. All this I have spoken before you, O Lord, because you have said that it was for us that you created the, the, this world. And now, O Lord, behold, these nations which are reputed as nothing, domineer over us and devour us. But we, your people, whom you have called your firstborn, only begotten, zealous for you, and the most dear, have been given to you into their hands. James Charlesworth, yeah, Old the, Testament Pseudepigrapha, Volume 1. Yeah. So it's the usual story, you know, why are the Jews in Babylonian captivity? Why are they in Medo-Persian captivity? Why are they overrun by the, the Greeks? Why are they overrun by the Romans? In, in this case, he's talking about the Romans. I mean, if we are God's two people, we're supposed to be the ones that are ruling, right? We're not supposed to be overrun by all these pagans. That was well, certainly the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Yeah. It's very likely that the people to whom Paul was writing felt much the same way Paul was making the point that Jesus fulfilled all the predictions of the future king and high priest predicted in the Old Testament. Thus, Jesus became our Savior, the one who makes it possible for God's blessings to include all of us. Hebrews 8.1, jumping way over in the middle of the book, tells us that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Thus, the main point of Hebrews, now our author is going to try to give us a summary here. The main point of Hebrews is to show that by his life and his death, Jesus successfully answered all of Satan's accusations and questions against the government of God. Thus, once and for all, winning the great controversy over God's character and government. As a result, all heaven is celebrating his victory. Now, I have to admit that this wasn't part of the lesson study. This is stuff that I added. But, Carrie? Reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. And so, in honor of the name Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's from American Bible Society, 1992. Okay, now, how many does that include? Every, all the beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below? Does that, does that include Satan? Satan, Lucifer himself. It includes Satan himself is going to be bowing down. And that will happen at the third, third coming. coming a time after God, Christ is raised up high above this, the New Jerusalem and he's crowned um, as king of the, of the universe. And then there's that panorama and all the wicked on the outside and all the righteous on the inside will see the story of the great controversy from beginning to end. And this, the, the, the evidence will be so compelling that even Satan himself will be down on his knees saying, God, I wish you could see it now. You, yeah, wouldn't that be incredible? This is going to be 3D living color. It's going to make Steven Spielberg turn green. 
can you imagine God projecting the history of the great controversy in the sky? Yeah. Just so everyone's going to see that. Everyone is going to see that. Everyone who is alive at that time or has been alive on this earth at any time. Yeah. The sec all, all, all the, all the. All, all the, the righteous, righteous who, who, who this the is wicked. at the end of the thousand years, the righteous have been in heaven for a thousand years, they come down. And all the wicked who have died at any time from the days of Cain, presumably, to our day, uh, all of them will be resurrected and they'll be on the outside down there, outside there looking in. Everyone will see this. And this is really important, and not to deviate from my lesson a little bit, this is really important because God refuses to bring the great controversy to a conclusion until every single person, including Satan himself, has said, yes, God, you did it right. There's nothing more you could have done. He doesn't want any doubts to be left in the minds of anybody in the entire universe. And that's how he, he, he accomplishes that, that incredible situation. Well, Paul reminded us that while living in this sinful world, we are still under the control or rule of Satan and have been, have been since the time of Adam and Eve disobeying in the Garden of Eden. Satan still claims to be the ruler of this world and the Apostle John recognized that role. Uh, we, we were familiar with that. Remember John uh, 12, 31? Now is the time for this world to be judged now the rule of this world will be overthrown. And what, is, what, Jesus, what was Jesus talking about? How, how is Satan going to be overthrown? The, the first one is, of course, when he was thrown from heaven. Okay. Uh, we read that in Ezekiel 28, yeah. uh, Revelation chapter. Yeah. Chapter 12, 12, 12 and, and, right. and Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, right, yeah. right. But so Satan's downfall has been in three steps. From, first of all, he's kicked out of heaven. And secondly, at the time of the cross, the rest of the universe, not we humans, but the rest of the universe sees what kind of an absolute scoundrel he is, and they refuse to pay him any attention after that. So now he's fallen from heaven, Luke uh, what is that, 10, 18, I think it is, he's fallen from heaven. And then finally at the end, even all of us will say, no, you know, you're the scoundrel, you did it. you're the one who messed things up, you're at fault, et cetera, et cetera. At the cross, at the cross, the controversy between Christ and Satan had ended, between the two persons. Yeah, well. It's done. Yeah, right, it is right. finished. When Christ right. said it is finished, it was, as far as the rest of the universe was concerned, it was finished. Right. They will never again give Satan even five seconds to, to listen to him. But the climactic event of the great controversy is going to be at the third coming when every knee shall bow. That's going to be the finale. Right. Even as humans. Even yeah. as humans, yes. Yeah. So, cast out of heaven, cast out of the thoughts of the entire onlooking universe, and finally, at the third coming, us too. What happened in heaven when Jesus returned following his victory and his battle with Satan here on this earth? What do we learn from Hebrews? Hebrews 5, uh, 1 to 14. For God never said to any of his angels, you are my son, today I have become your father. Nor did God say about any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son. But when God was about to send his firstborn son into the world, he said, all God's angels must worship him. But about the angels, God said, God makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. Can I interrupt there for a second? Please. This is a <laughs> very important key text. Some of you are aware that we have friends in other churches who don't believe that Jesus is divine, or at least for sure that he did not exist prior to his coming to this earth. Uh, they, they are Unitarian, that is, they believe that only, they worship only the Father, they don't worship Jesus. Well, look at this. God said, and if you, if you they, have a key, they have a key text for that. Let me just show you really quickly. Look at Romans, Romans 1. 
and starting with uh, verse 20. Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all. They know God, but they do not give him the honor that belongs to him, nor do they thank him. Be instead, their thoughts have become complete, complete nonsense and their empty minds are filled with darkness. They say they are wise, but they are fools. Instead of worshiping the immortal God, they worship images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals. And so God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire, and they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself who is to be praised forever. And they, they will say, we, we, we don't worship Christ because He, he was a creature. It goes on. I mean, it won't take time to read all the rest of it. Very quickly, though, <clears throat> don't they then fit into the um, definition for Antichrist? Well, that's another issue, but potentially, yes. But they, yes. Yes. But you see here, this, if, if they, the book, what Paul said, and, you know, and the pagan said in, in Paul's day, you know, don't do that. And yet God say, here says, worship, worship him. So if you ever speak with one of these people, compare Romans 1 with Hebrews 1 here, and uh, you either have to say God is a liar or uh, you got a problem. I think in John 1, it says, in there, uh, in, Jesus was the Word, yeah. and the in Word the was a God. They use the, the, instead, of, instead yeah. of the Word was God, they say it was a God. Is that in Greek? It is in Greek, actually. That a God. Well, there's there's nothing there. There's in nothing. the beginning was the word, word was God. God, right? Is what so, it says. So how does it in the Greek? How does it? That's come? what it, the the Greek is. The word was God. God. Okay. And so, if you if you if you put in the or you put in a or our God or anything else like that, that's a choice that's of the translator. That they put uh -huh. in there. So they put in. They put in this. They they put in in their translation. They put in a small a and then a small g. The word was a god. Whichever way the translator chooses, but you know Greek, so that's why yeah. I turned toward you. You yeah. see, and then how do you go for then the verse fourteen? And the God was made flesh, and He dwelt yeah. among us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. After that, go ahead, Sally. About uh, let's see. About the sun. Yeah, right. right. Verse About eight. the sun, however, God said, Your kingdom, O God, will last forever and ever. You rule over people with justice. You love that what is right and hate what is wrong. That is why God, your God, has chosen you and has given you the joy of an honor far greater than he gave to your companions. He also said, The Lord in the beginning created the earth, and with your own hands you made the heavens. They will disappear, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothes. You will fold them up like a coat, and they will be changed like clothes. But you are always the same, and your life never ends. God never said to any of his angels, Sit here on my right until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. What are the angels then? What are spirits who serve God and are sent by him to help those who are to uh, receive salvation, Good News Bible. Okay, and we should be so thankful that the angels take care of us. Mm, for sure. Notice that, notice that there are three steps pictured in these verses as God established his son as the victor in the great controversy. One, God received his son, Jesus, recognizing him as his divine son, Hebrews 1, 5. Two, God introduced his son to the heavenly court, who in turn worshiped him, recognizing that he was the original creator of everything and has returned to heaven to rule, verses 6 to 12. And three, God placed his son in the seat of power over the universe. And remember, the person sits down at the right side. That's the, that's the, the position of honor. Satan started his rebellion in heaven because he wanted to take the place of Christ or at least be considered equal with him. By demonstrating that Jesus was fully God, creator of the universe, and superior to any angel, including Lucifer, Satan, Hebrews states that Christ must be worshipped. 
God thus demonstrated the right of Jesus Christ to be seated at the right hand of the Father as ruler of the entire universe, including this earth, which for a while was un has been under the control of Satan. In our previous lesson, we suggested that Paul was the author of Hebrews. From the teacher's Bible study guide, strictly speaking, however, the writer of the book of Hebrews appears to be anonymous. Speculation has given rise to at least 13 possible authorial candidates, such as Luke, Barnabas, Jude, Stephen, Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos, or even Mary, the mother of Jesus. What we safely can infer about the authorship from the epistle itself are four facts. First, the author must have been well-educated. Hebrews has by far the best Greek of the New Testament. And the hardest to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Second, the author was acquainted with Jewish methods of interpreting scripture, such as and you can say Gezera Shabbat, argument by analogy, and other such techniques. Third, the author is steeped in the Jewish scriptures. Hebrews has the most extensive use of the Old Testament quotes. Fourth, the author knew Timothy, Hebrews 13.23. All of these facts speak in favor of, rather than against, Pauline authorship. Certainly the author chose to remain anonymous for undisclosed reasons. His anonymity may even suggest that his message is more important than his identity. At the same time, we would be remiss if we failed to acknowledge that Ellen White attests to Pauline authorship of the book of Hebrews. Moving forward in faith in that divine disclosure, we shall refer throughout the lessons with confidence to the author as Paul. Again, yep. from the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Teacher's Edition. And I would like to add one more thing, and Graham Maxwell, that some of us highly respect, had this idea, idea as well, and others before him have had that idea. The, the, the vocabulary and so forth in, in, in Hebrews sounds very sophisticated. What, lang what language was the, natural, the mother tongue for, for Luke? He was a Greek. He was a Greek physician. Right. Very sophisticated language. Right. And in many places, if you look, if you, if you look study he, Greek, you'll see that in many places in Hebrews, the only other place where those, that word is found is in either Acts or Luke, which are written by Luke. Luke. So that's that similarity. But... The theology and the Old the Testament referral from the Old Testament and so forth sounds more like Paul. But then Paul and Luke worked together for years and years. So why can't why couldn't this be a combo of effort with Paul and Luke working together and Luke putting the, the into the very best Greek and Paul giving the ideas? I, I think that's the best. We will end. we will ask when we go to heaven. But to me, if you need you look at the style. Mm -hmm. the style and the depth of the theology then it uh, it just makes me think that this is Paul writing yeah one of the most important messages that Jesus needed to convey to his Hebrew associates and that would be through Paul we believe and the people of Israel were the, were, uh, the many ways in which his life and his death fulfilled many prophecies from the Old Testament I mean if you stop and think about this if you believe in the Old Testament, which would be the true of the Jewish people in his day, and you believe those things are, there were prophecies there from the Old Testament of the coming Messiah, and then you demonstrate that those things were all fulfilled in the life of Jesus, that's a pretty compelling argument. That's not something that a person could make up by himself, say, well, you know, those people writing hundreds of years ago were talking about me. Well. That's a is, pretty. is that part of what most of the Christians today lose when they accept really only the New Testament? Yep. So, a number of those prophecies were given in the form describing a future son of David. Compare 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 16. Uh, I'm going to read that one because we're going to talk about it several times later on. So let me just read that one. So tell my servant David... And that I, the Lord Almighty, say to him, I took you from looking after sheep in the fields and made you the ruler of my people Israel. 
I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have been defeated all your enemies as you advanced. I will make you as famous as the greatest leaders in the world. I have chosen a place for my people Israel and have settled them there where they would they will live without being oppressed anymore. Ever since they entered the land, they have been attacked by violent people. And of course, that's talking about the, the, the time of the judges. But this will not happen again. I promise to keep you safe from all your enemies and to give you give you descendants. When you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons king and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me. Now, who was that? Solomon. That would be Solomon. And I will make sure that his dynasty continues forever. How could that happen? Through Christ. Only through Christ. I will be his father, and this is a, another example we already talked about in our last lesson, God saying, I will be his father. He, now he's saying, I will be the father of Solomon, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him as a father punishes his son, and so forth. Okay, and that's quoted, part of that's quoted in Luke 1. Jesus was born in the line of David, in the city of David, Matthew 1 and Luke 2. He was called the son of David, and even when he was crucified, the sign over his head read the king of the Jews, Matthew 27, 37. Many of the apostles, especially Peter and Paul, taught that Jesus had risen from the dead in fulfillment of the promises made to David. So that's a pretty compelling argument. I don't know how you would fake that one. These passages demonstrate that Jesus Christ was no ordinary human being, but rather he was the true Son of God and the Son of Man who had been predicted in Scripture hundreds of years before his birth. So when we say in Hebrew and or Aramaic, if you say Son of God, you're really saying a divine person. If you say a Son of Man, what are you saying? He's truly a human being. So Jesus was truly divine and truly human at the same time. And of course, you would have to be human if you're going to be a descendant of David, right? Um, no created being, no angel, including Satan, or any human being could have arranged such a plan, and thus Christ proved himself to be the promised Messiah. Paul was anxious for us to recognize that Jesus is the true ruler of the universe and he only temporarily lost his rulership of this earth to Satan. And that wasn't his fault. Whose fault was that? It was our fault, Adam and Eve. Now God, Jesus Christ, has already won the great controversy through the life and death of Jesus. There is no way God can lose. In what sense is Jesus our mediator? The Old Testament seems to suggest that the promised Davidic king, son, descendant of David, would somehow represent the Israelite nation before God. This, however, presents a problem. Contrary to Jewish tradition, Jesus became not only king, but also high priest. Kings were supposed to be from what tribe? Judah. Judah, which Jesus was. However, priests were supposed to be from the Amen. tribe of? Levi, which Jesus was not. That is why he is described as priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And we know, well, we'll talk more about that later. But, uh, in, in Exodus, it describes how these uh, things are spread out. And we just there it refers again to 2 Samuel 7, in which God claimed Israel as his son. But he predicted a future king whose dynasty will last forever. Furthermore, in Deuteronomy 12, 8 to 10, and 2 Samuel 7, there's 2 Samuel 7 again, God promised the children of Israel that he would fight their battles for them so they could live in peace. But they had to agree to that. They had to agree, and they had to allow him to do it. Didn't. More than that, God promised to dwell among them, even in the tabernacle or tent through those 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, I don't... I, I, try to I try to put myself in these stories as I read them. Imagine you're scattered out with a whole bunch of other people living in tents, moving from time to time. 
but you walk out the door. You know, I, I lived in Africa for a number of years in northern Tanzania, and we could walk out our door, and there was Mount Kilimanjaro. We just as beautiful as you can be. But imagine walking out your door, and there's God hovering over the tabernacle in a cloud, a pillar of fire at night, a pillar of cloud by day. I know. How, how, how would that impact you? Amazing, huh? God told them that a specific site would be given them in the land in which they were going. Of course, that was Jerusalem. That was the only place where they were to go and offer their animal sacrifices. And yet, in spite of this pillar of fire and pillar of cloud during the day of shade, they did all the things that they did. They, you know, yeah. did all the immoral things, all the uh, rejected God, God so many times. And God didn't reach out from that cloud and zap them. Well, a few times he did. <laughs> well, somehow. God's first covenant with the children of Israel established at Sinai failed because Israel very quickly turned away from fulfilling their responsibilities. And so God could not continue to bless them. So here's the question which is really, this question comes up many times in the Old Testament, and I don't hear people actually addressing it. So I'm going to ask you right now, why couldn't God bless the Israelites when they were disobedient? Did he re refuse to? Or was there a reason why he really couldn't? They chose another master. I mean, you can't, they can't, nobody can have two masters. Yeah. So okay. if, if, if they chose another master, he let, let those things happen to him. They well, but, him anyway. yeah? They wouldn't have heard him. Okay. Yeah. After all, he took them back into Canaan because of the faithfulness of their ancestors. Which ones? Well, he mentions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was a long time before. I know. But because of them, he took them into Canaan. Why couldn't he have done that for them at this point in time? Why is it that sometimes God says, I can't do this because you're disobedient, but other times he seems to do what he needs to do, even though, I mean, look at, there wasn't a time when the children of Israel were just marvelous saints, and yet God kept working with them. But sometimes he couldn't. So my question is why? Well, maybe the idea is that they had chosen another master. Alternatively, go with Jim's idea. How, are you gonna, uh, if you, how do you educate people? Uh, if, if, well, like somebody pays a, pays a fine for somebody. Mm -hmm. does, does a person who was the, the culprit in, or the, the offender really learn anything if somebody bails you out? <laughs> no consequences, you know, and what you do is reinforce that false sense of entitlement or whatever you yeah. want to do. Yeah. E education takes time. I think Ellen White says, uh, well, edu redemption is education. And, 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 educate, and sanctification is the work of a lifetime. <sighs> There's no quick, yeah. short, quick fix to well, that. No, Go ahead. Not one king of the north <clears throat> followed God. Not one. And only a few in and the south. And only four of the south. With but even... following that failure, sorry, God established a new covenant, a new relationship with all human beings who are faithful. Thus our only hope of salvation is found in faithfulness to Jesus. By successfully dealing with Satan and all of his accusations and questions, Jesus Christ has made it possible for sin to be eliminated and for harmony and peace to be reestablished throughout the entire universe, including on this one rebellious planet. Imagine that day. If Jesus had failed in any way during his mission to this earth, the entire universe would have been in peril and the great controversy would not have been won. But Jesus came with a very specific purpose, to do away with sin. Okay, how do you do away with sin? Romans said, chapter 8, verse 3, What the law could not do, because the human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature. He condemned sin in human nature by sending His own Son, who came, 
with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. Goodness Bible. To do away with sin. He came to do away with sin. So how do you get rid of sin? Well, Paul said something more about that there in Hebrews 9, 26. Go ahead. For then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to warn you that um, there's going to be two very different ideas about how that happens in this series of lessons. To many people, many Christians, the idea is the way Christ gets rid of sin is he pays the price. That God pours out his wrath on Jesus, which he did, if you understand the word correctly. He poured out his wrath on Jesus and now the Father can relax because he's got his pound of flesh. That's kind of like Jim's paying bail. Yeah, exactly. Nobody learns at, when you operate at that level. Yeah. You learn the wrong lesson, I guess, what, what I really should say. And the other approach is that Jesus comes, Satan had said no human being can live on this earth and remain faithful to God. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. And Satan, there were three things that, that Satan made, claims that he made about Christ coming to this earth. First of all, he said, not a single human being has lived on this earth without sinning. I will get Jesus to sin. He failed in that. Then he said, okay, if I can't get him to sin, I'm going to make things so difficult for him that he won't have to sin. He'll just have to say, this is too, this is too ridiculous, too hard. I'll just go back to heaven. Failing that, he said, we, when, Jesus is, when Jesus is dead, he and all his angels did everything they possibly could to keep that, gra that grave shut. They couldn't. All three times they failed. So, Jesus deals with sin by showing us, okay, here's the truth about what sin does to you. This is the second death. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and here's the, the other choices. Do you choose life or do you choose death? Uh, yeah, very quickly, in the Old Testament, the Lord uh, put his credibility on the balance with Job as well. Mm -hmm. Job could have failed, but he did not. Yeah. So what should we learn from all of that? Are we perpetually faithful contrary to the children of Israel? Our only hope is by committing ourselves to be followers of Jesus Christ in every possible way and every step of our lives. That is the goal. One of the very interesting things to be observed from the Old Testament is that whenever the children of Israel went to battle following God's instructions, they experienced resounding victories often without losing a single Israelite soldier. But whenever they went to battle without, con in fact, some battles they won without having even to, having even to fight. But when they, whenever they went to battle without consulting God, they experienced disastrous defeats. Now you would have thought after a while, they would have figured that out. <laughs> Why do you think it was that they did not seem to get that message? There were times when there were magnificent victories on behalf of God's people that are recorded in the Old Testament. Think of the case of David's battle with Goliath. I mean, you know. Do you think David was really a good aim or do you think God guided that stone? Or he both. was pretty good, by the way. There's no yeah. doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. The Lord guided. Both. Both. You want, to make, you want to go for both. Okay. And who told Saul, Saul to pull back his helmet? Maybe Go, Satan Goliath. did. <laughs> Goliath to pull his helmet. I mean, Goliath. I'm sorry. Goliath to pull back his helmet. Well, God had told the Israelites that he was to be their king. But the day came following the rebellious behavior of Samuel's sons when the children of Israel demanded a king like the nations around them. And you know that story. In our day, we are not asked to go out and fight in physical battles. But we do have a serious enemy, our greatest enemy, Satan. And King Jesus will help us to defeat him. 
We know that Jesus defeated Satan every time they met in conflict, starting with the war in heaven. Revelation 12, 7 through 12, in case you haven't read that recently. Down through the temptations in this wilderness and his entire life and ministry on this earth. But even in the Old Testament, God promised to fight for the weak and oppressed. See Isaiah 42 and 59. It is very significant to notice that God's original plan for the children of Israel, after he had led them out of Egypt, following the ten plagues and the marvelous crossing of the Red Sea, it was given to Moses at Mount Sinai as recorded in Exodus 20, verses 20 through 33. And I'm watching the clock there. You remember what that promise, original promise was? I'll do the fighting. God, God says, I will do the fighting. I will take you in. I will scatter the people in front of you and so forth. Why didn't they accept that? They wanted to do it their way. They how wanted could, the credit. Like the song goes. How could any sensible person turn down an offer like that? But they did. They wanted to conquer with, the, with their swords and their own spears so they would get the credit instead of relying completely on God. How did God promise them that? Did he speak to the people? I mean, how did he plan to do that? Well, he, he planned to do it, but how did he let the people know that, this, that he would do that? Well, he told Moses, and they wrote, Moses wrote it down. Okay. It's right there in, 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 in uh, Exodus, 20. uh, Exodus well, 23. Moses, they didn't believe. They didn't trust his, his, his words. Well, we are in mortal combat with the devil every day. That is spelled out in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where it talks about we are against, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and powers and so forth. And then what, what weapons we need to put on. However, we are not asked to fight alone. God is our companion and he goes to battle with us. It is important to note that in those verses, the subject pronouns are all, this is in Ephesians 6, are all plural. Not you fight, you go this, you do, you, you, you. It's we, us, our. We are not to fight alone. So how do we go, and how, how successful are we at fighting alone? Not. <laughs> so now, we, so how do we go about putting on the whole armor of God? Hebrews 5 through 7 talks about Jesus being our high priest. As we have already noted, he did not come from the tribe of Levi, and therefore he should not have been recognized as a priest. But Psalm 110, verse 4, and Hebrews 5, 5 and 6 say, Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord made a solemn promise and will not take it back. You will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. What do we know about Melchizedek's parents and his, his children? Don't. Nothing. Nothing. Hebrews 5, 5 and 6. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the honor of being a high priest. Instead, God said to him, You are my son. Today I become your father. He also said in another place, You will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. So what did Christ do that signified that he was an officiating priest? What is supposed to be the role of a priest? In every system of priesthood, whether Jewish, G Jewish, Greek, Roman, or any other, including modern priests, their role is to help us to relate to God. In order for us to have a right relationship to God, we must know Him. That task of teaching us about the Father was done infinitely well by God Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. One of the main functions of the priest was to teach the people the truth about God. Not only could, uh, no one could do that better than Jesus. So let us summarize that that priests did several things. One, they instructed the, this is in the Old Testament, of course, they instructed the people how to correctly offer their sacrifices to God. Two, they spent a great deal of time teaching the people how to obey the laws of God. Furthermore, three, they were expected to bless the people. And there's a famous blessing, as you know, in number six. Then they we apparently didn't do a very good job at number two, teaching the people no, how they to didn't. obey the laws of God. Hmm. Well, we find out something surprising in First Peter two nine, Jim. But you are the the chosen race, the 
king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. So who is supposed to be the priest now? We every are. believer. Every one of us. Every <clears throat> believer. We, all believers in Jesus, are called a royal priesthood or the king's priests. The role implies, Carrie, you want to pick that one up? Reading from 1 Peter 2 9. No, the one that, that down below oh, that. Role. This thing here, sorry. This role implies incredible privileges. Priests could approach God in the sanctuary. Today, we can approach God through prayer with confidence. And I mentioned Hebrews 4, 4 14 to 16, Hebrews 10, 19, 23. There are, as well, important responsibilities. We must collaborate with God in His work of saving the world. He wants us to teach and explain God's laws and precepts to others. He also wants us to offer sacrifices of praise and good works which are pleasing to Him. What a privilege and what a responsibility. That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide uh, for Wednesday. Jesus Himself made that very clear. What's our, supposed to be our role and how, we, how, do, how do we approach God? Sally? John 16, 25 to 27. Jesus, in parentheses. He's, he's speaking. Yeah. Have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech. I will speak to you plainly about the Father. When the day comes, you will ask him in my name. And I do not say, I will ask him on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Good News Bible. Okay. So, do we need a priest between us and God now? We are the priest. We are supposed to be the priest. We are supposed to be able to approach God directly. Paul also recognized that in Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weakness, weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will, find, we will receive mercy and find grace to help as, us just when we need it. Good News Bible. So how, how should that impact our relationship to God? Charles? Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse <clears throat> 19 to 23. We have then, by my brothers and sisters, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. I'm going to interrupt for a second. The book of Hebrews, many people will tell you this is a book about how a priest, Jesus, stands between us and God. But look at what he's saying right here. We'll go straight. Okay. He opened for us a new way, a living way, through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from the, a guilty conscience and with the bodies washed with clean water. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we possess because we can trust God to keep his promise. Goodness Bible. And there again, the first Peter 2, 9, but you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light from the Good News Bible. However, in Hebrews 8 through 10, we discover a problem. Why does the death and life of Jesus give us complete freedom to go into the most holy place? God's friends no longer fear him. 
they now fear sin because they have come to know the truth about sin and its consequences as first described by God in Genesis 2, 17. What's the result of sin? Death. Jim, you want to pick that one up? Genesis 2, 16 and 17. You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the fruit, excuse me, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. And? Romans six twenty three. For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Good News Bible. So twice in the book of Hebrews, Paul repeated the new covenant promise from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Carrie? Reading from Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12. But God finds fault with his people when he says, The days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will draw up a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. They were not faithful to the covenant I made with them, and so I paid no attention to them. Now this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. In the days to come, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach their fellow citizens or to say to their fellow citizens, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. For the least, no, rather, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. From the Good News Bible. Okay, so by appointing Jesus as our high priest, the Father inaugurated a new covenant that will accomplish what the old covenant could only anticipate. What was wrong with the old covenant? People ignored it. Yeah. They, they broke their side of the covenant all heart, you know, almost minutes after it was, yeah. you know, they were dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf. Well, they were the same people that said, uh, don't let Moses, excuse me, don't let God talk to us. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you tell us what he said and then we'll do it. And, uh, and then they said, well, in, their, in Joshua, if anybody steps out of line, kill him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you going to com communicate to people at, at that level of, uh, yeah. of development? Well, the new covenant delivers what only a perfect, eternal, human, divine priest can. The high priest not only explains the law of God, but also implants the law in our hearts. The priest offers a sacrifice that brings forgiveness. This priest uh, this priest offers a sacrifice that brings forgiveness. This priest cleanses and transforms us. He transforms our hearts from stone to flesh, Ezekiel 20, 36, 26. He really creates us anew, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This priest blesses us in the most incredible way by providing us access into the very presence <clears throat> of the Father himself <clears throat> from our Bible study guide for Thursday, January 6th. And then Ezekiel 36, 26, which was mentioned there. Um, go ahead, Carrie. The Lord said, I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. From the Good News Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. That's from the Good News Bible. So Paul also gave a number of warnings found in Hebrews 10 through 12. These warnings are given in the following form. First, they all compare to that desert generation of Israelites with the readers of Hebrews. Second, they exhort us to have faith, <coughs> excuse me, which is what the Israelites in the desert lacked. Think of all that God did with the children of Israel to get them out of Egypt and safely established in the land of Canaan. But nevertheless, they rebelled against him. They lacked faith. And so what about us? We not only have the record of everything that the Israelites did and all that God did for them, 
but also we have the entire record of the life and death of Jesus, not to mention the whole history of the Old Testament. Will we have faith then? Paul concludes, Hebrews 10, 37 to 39, For as the scriptures say, just a little while longer, and he who is coming will come. He will not delay. My righteous people, however, will believe and live. But if any of them turns back, I will not be pleased with him. We are not people who turn back and are lost. Instead, we have faith and are saved. Good News Bible. Yes. If Jesus is our champion who goes before us into the battle against the devil, how can we cooperate together with them and with others in the church? What things are preventing us from doing that right now? How does Satan succeed in weakening our church? How did he weaken Israel in the past? Look what the devil was able to do through the Midianite women at Baal Peor. And that's the story in Numbers 25. You know, here they are. They've been through 40 years. Well, God got them out of Egypt. He took care of them for 40 years in the desert. They're on the border of the Promised Land. Just the Jordan River separates them from Jericho. And what are they doing? Dancing drunk and naked and carrying on with these pagan fertility cult things. If we allow our human passions and selfishness to overcome us, we will lose as they did. So what should be the solution? We need to spend more time in three things that God, the Bible challenges us to do. Bible study, prayer, and especially witnessing. Many of us do not realize how poorly we understand our doctrinal teachings until we try to explain them to others. So in what ways is our situation similar to that of the children of Israel in the desert? We have a much more important Canaan to enter. What, what Canaan are we entering? The heavenly one. Mm -hmm. Heavenly one. We must not allow distractions and temptations from the devil to delay our preparations. Christ agreed to take a temporary role lower than the angels while he was on this earth, Hebrews 2.9. He is now seated at the right hand of God, superior to angels, Hebrews 1.4. So how did he arrive at that position? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 from Good News by from actually from the uh, American, New American Standard. Yeah. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers of the pro in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Paul wants to tell his audience and us that God spoke and still speaks. God spoke in different time periods long ago, and he speaks in these last days. He speaks to different recipients, the fathers and us. He speaks to different agents, the prophets and the son. God speaks in many ways. What are some of his avenues of communication? Can you just mention some? <clears throat> Scripture. He spoke face to face with Adam and Eve. He prophets. speaks. He spoke. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush. And he spoke through the prophets. And faced almost face to face with Moses. Yeah. Yeah. And these these appearances like that are called. There's a technical name for that. It's called a theophany, a, a God appearance. To Moses, uh, something we uh, okay. Okay, a revelation of God to Balaam through a donkey. That's an interesting <laughs> way. To the boy Samuel calling him by name, 1 Samuel 3.10. To Elijah in a still small voice, we, voice, we already talked about that, 1 Kings 19.12. To a vision to Isaiah in the temple, Isaiah 6, 1 to 9. And to Hosea through his family circumstances, Hosea 1, 2. In fact, the whole first two chapters. All these modes of communication have one thing in common. They are incomplete. The ultimate and climactic utterance of God is in these last days when he speaks to his son. Not only does God speak through the words of Jesus, but God and also speaks through Jesus' actions and character. God's revelation is progressive, but the progression is not from true to truer, from mature to more mature. 
Rather, it is forward and honored movement in his revelation of himself to humanity. When speaking through the words and actions of Jesus, God himself is the speaker. And that's again from our Bible study, Bible study guide. Paul made seven affirmations about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Hebrews 1, 2, Hebrews 1, 2 to 4, which make him far superior to any created being or any angel. And that's in, they're found in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, pages 27 and 28. We'll summarize them here briefly, from which the following is summarized. One, Jesus is appointed Jesus Christ is appointed heir of all things. What does that mean to you? Heir of all things? He's the king and lord over everything in the entire universe, right? If he is a principal heir, his followers should be co-heirs with him and are those who are to inherit salvation. Hebrews 1, 14. And see Revelation 21, 7, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, where it clearly states that those who are conquer those who conquer will inherit the kingdom of God, while wrongdoers will not. Two, Christ is superior to the angels because he was the original creation agent. All things were created by him. In fact, I mean, Satan himself, I mean, Satan recognizes this. He was created by God. Uh, God created us in the beginning and he will have the power to recreate us at the second coming. If you don't think God created us back in the beginning, are you worried about his recreating us when he comes back? Anyway, Christ is the reflection of God's glory. He was 1-3. The Greek term translated exact imprint refers to character and implies a mark impressed on an object, especially on coins. Both descriptions of Jesus as God's reflection are the exact imprint and to indicate that Jesus is the full and adequate representation of the Father what Paul conveyed is like what Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And I'm going to have to jump over this. Christ was not only created, but is also continually sustains us. He managed to do away with sins, having accomplished everything which he set out to do in the great controversy to his mission to this earth, he is seated at the right hand of God. And finally, we see that Christ is much superior to the angels. In these last days, he speaks through the Son, God does, uh, creator of all things is a reflection and impact of, of God's very being sustained to all things made purification for sins sat down at the right hand of God thus Christ is exalted above and superior to all angels shall we pray our kind and loving father we thank you for these clear revelations of your character through your son and through all the predecessors their words are also of help to us, but especially we th we're thankful for the times, the life, and the death of Jesus, which speaks so, may so loudly about you and about your character. May we be followers of yours and his, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.